Hello and welcome to the second episode of season two of the Living Legacy series from Of the I Sing American Heritage Through Song. I am Audrey Johnson, classically trained opera singer and founder of Of the I Sing, and I'm thrilled to share in another wonderful episode of this series with you today. The mission of Of the I Sing is to bring American heritage to life through music, and a cornerstone of this mission is the support and championing of living American composers, because they are the living legacy of our nation's musical heritage and culture. I especially love featuring their settings of American texts, because this brings our national treasury of literature to the forefront as well. I believe deeply in our nation's music and poetry, and it is an honor to be an ambassador of this music with the mission of bringing people together through the power of song. Today, I am honored to be joined by composer Christopher Palestrant, who has written a beautiful composition, especially for this series. An accomplished composer, Christopher Palestrant's works and arrangements have been performed from New York City to the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, and throughout the United States by ensembles, including the Samuel Barber String Quartet, the Santa Fe Desert Chorale, the Smoky Mountain Brass Quintet, the Albemarle Symphony Orchestra, and the Tidewater Winds. He is the recipient of the third biannual Michael Hennigan Prize, a prize runner in the Turner Classic Movies Young Film Composers Competition, and the Randolph S. Rothschild Prize in Composition. His music and writings have been selected for presentation at the College Music Society National Conferences, the Society for Ethnomusicology, and the Intercollegiate Music Association, as the Carol Grotmus Belk Visiting Composer to Western Carolina University and for the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing, China. Chris's compositions include orchestral works, numerous chamber pieces, choral music, and one-act operas. His primary teachers in composition include Nicholas Ma, Morris Cotel, Tom Benjamin, and Jack Gallagher, and master classes with John Corleano, Samuel Adler, and John Maxwell Geddes. He earned degrees from the College of Worcester, New York University, and the Peabody Conservatory of the Johns Hopkins University. Chris is a professor of music composition at Elizabeth City State University, where he has been honored as the Teacher of the Year by the University of North Carolina Board of Governors. He has been listed in the Who's Who in America publications annually since 2011. Chris also serves as the musicologist on the board of the Feldman Chamber Music Society of Norfolk, Virginia, and is a member of the award-winning blues band Uphill, performing regularly throughout the Mid-Atlantic. Please join me in welcoming composer Chris Palestrant. Chris, welcome. It is marvelous to have you on the series today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, it's it's just wonderful. And you know, gosh, we've been planning this for I don't know how many months now. <laughs> Well, COVID got between artists and our works uh, for a, about a year, year and a half. It's nice to be getting back into the world of the arts. It sure is, definitely. And, you know, working with somebody like you that has been utilizing that time so effectively and in such a positive way, uh, you know, so the piece that, that we'll be showing today that we'll talk about a little bit later, you know, has been in the works for, for a long time. So while things were shut down, that didn't mean that, you know, wonderful artwork couldn't be still uh, created during that time. So it's just going to be a wonderful, a wonderful day today. And my goodness, in reading your bio and sharing all of your amazing accolades and your background all of the highlights of your career, um, I was so struck by, you know, not only the high caliber of artistry that you have achieved, but in so many different areas of music, you know, that you are, um, you're a top rate composer that you've, been, you know, the Kennedy Center has featured you all of, of so many kinds of places have featured you, um, that you have won so many awards as a teacher, as a professor of composition, and that your blues band Uphill travels the country to great acclaim. So, I would just love to know how this all started for you, because however it started, put you on quite a path. Wow, uh, the beginnings of the journey, uh, we can go well back. Um, <laughs> my, uh, in terms of, of original music, in terms of composition, I, that's got to go back to like age four or five. I mean, a very, very young age. Uh, I mean, everyone, I, I think most people get music stuck in their head. 
uh, and, then, and there are some times where that's very prominent, like if you're on a, a walk in the woods or, or maybe in the shower, places where there aren't other distractions, uh, you're tapped into the music in your head. It just took me a little longer to figure out that it wasn't um, you know, anybody else's music, that I was hearing original stuff in my head, and, and it took me longer to figure out that that doesn't happen to everybody everywhere. Um, but, I, but musical ideas have bounced around there forever. Uh, and when I got more serious about it with uh, higher ed, with college, um, I was still divided between a love of different disciplines. My undergraduate work was part theater and, and part composition. Uh, and uh, my alma mater, the College of Worcester, allowed me to fashion a joint degree out of both of those disciplines. The first master's was theater, by, largely by convenience. I had a great offer from New York University. And it wasn't until after that that it became wholesale composition uh, all the way and, and uh, fully professionally all the time. Wow, what a great story. And yes, you, from everything that I've experienced with the College of Worcester, it is an absolutely wonderful institution, not only with the top rate education, but also the way that the, the professors and the faculty, the way that they empower students. I am not at all surprised, though I am very impressed uh, by the way that they embraced your love of these two areas, you know, that they did not make you choose, that they did not make you feel that that was a conflict of interest that was a detriment, that they actually played to your strengths and really, you know, empowered you to, to have that, that combination. So I'm sure that that set you, you know, on this path that's incredible. And how wonderful that you were able, as you say, in your master's degree to really focus on theater. I am sure that that um, strongly and directly influences your compositional style and, and the way that you approach composing. Absolutely. Uh, no question about it. Uh, in fact, theater underpins most aspects of my life. I mean, I'm a classroom faculty teacher. And, and just before we're speaking today, I'm, I'm walking out of a classroom, which is <laughs> is in sort of a theatrical presentation, even when we're discussing the origins of Baroque music. Um, but sure, uh, I would say that theater and music are codependent, uh, that musical performance is inherently theater and the rhythms of music affect even non-musical theatrical productions uh they're 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 almost one in the same uh and i think it's important for for all performers composers as well to bear in mind the 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 milieu the, the performance discipline the theatricality of putting music in, in front of an audience certainly the majority of music that i've written is programmatic uh it, it's telling a specific story uh double so when we're dealing with like the, the piece in hand today, which is setting an actual text and the music has to support that story. But even when I'm writing instrumental music, uh, I'm, I'm interested in telling stories of, of written pieces for, for large ensembles that try to, to depict um, ships going out at sea or uh, battles in the American Revolution or uh, the life story of a horse, uh, and, you know, including a sort of a fantastical sequence of, of a death and resurrection of a horse, if that's not sacrilegious. Um, <laughs> but uh, storytelling in, in music, I think, is important. Music itself is in, in expressing emotion, uh, always. Uh, I would argue that the abstraction in music is the allows music to be the most direct link we have to the human soul, to expressing emotion in its raw, unbridled form. Uh, it's and that that abstraction is is neat when you're trying to wrap it around telling a very specific story as well. So yeah, theater. Wow, <laughs> that was a quite a profound answer, Chris. Thank you. Yes, I could not agree more. I think that most com composers and musicians feel that that is why what we do is so important because as you said it it is that that direct link to the expression of the soul it takes us beyond things that can be expressed in words even when we are singing words it's not just that we you know, why would we sing it as opposed to speaking it because that music brings that whole nother level to it and so thank you for articulating that so beautifully that is oh that's just excellent um and in your explanation just now that you were giving you gave a few examples um during talking about the programmatic side especially Especially orchestral things, and you alluded a little bit to ships and to the Revolutionary War. Um, there's a particular piece, is there not, that you've written for orchestra that deals with those elements? Sure. Um, actually, both of those uh, plot lines that you mentioned were for pieces that I wrote for the Tidewater Winds, uh, that is a, a 52 piece professional concert band uh, here in my region, in the Tidewater region. They perform a, a summer concert series. Uh, 
like John Philip Sousa would have done 100 years ago uh, to public venues uh, throughout our region, which is uh, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, uh, Chesapeake. Uh, and I developed a relationship with them a few years ago. They had me uh, write a work uh, for them uh, and gave several performances of, of several pieces now. I've written three works for them, the second of which does involve the launching of a ship, Port of Freedom. Uh, and I, to get that programmatic quality, went in and literally was talking to other friends who were in the Navy. And I talked to a Navy captain who got me a copy of what they call the call regs, which is how uh, ships signal each other and the rules for uh, for naval engagement. And um, so if I have a start part of the story where the ship is going to leave at a certain hour and, and you're ringing the bells, it's the correct hour. Or if the ship is blasting its horn before reversing, I, that signal had to be exactly right. And I had a lot of fun with that. Wow. Oh my goodness. I love that level of, of detail and legitimacy. What an amazing angle and approach to bring to that piece. And I'm sure that that was very much appreciated uh, by those, um, by the, the naval um, captain that you received that from. And I'm sure that when, when that person finally heard the piece, they were really moved uh, by what you had composed. Uh, I would love if you would allow um, us to just share a, a brief little excerpt clip from the Port of Freedom, um, from that performance with, with that group. Would that be all right? With the Tidewater Winds, absolutely. Let's uh, take a look under their conductor, John Brewington. Wonderful. All right. Well, you guys, let's just take a moment and we'll listen to a little bit of that. Oh, it's beautiful. Chris, it's just excellent. Thank you so much for, for sharing. And you know, I love your, your explanation about, again, that programmatic style, that storytelling, that theater. Um, I'm sure that all of us could could really, you know, feel that we were being swept along with the story, even just from that little excerpt. Um, and I will be sure to include the link for the entirety of, of that piece for those of you interested in watching the entirety. Thanks. You asked how theater ties in. Um, well, I've, I've announced before the uh, performance of that piece, I was able to be on stage and kind of talk the audience through the story. Um, and, and there again, um, I find that giving the audiences a, a sort of a link in a, a road into a, a new piece of music that they're hearing uh, is really important, um, especially in some of the more abstract uh, music of our last century or so. Uh, it's important to give the, the audience their feet, uh, something to listen for in a piece of music. Uh, and for me, telling a story with the music is the most natural way to do it. Beside which, I had a whole lot of military personnel in that audience. In our region, you're guaranteed a, a lot of, of uh, folks that are in the Navy, that are in the Coast Guard, the Army, uh, the Marines that are, that are listening to the work. So you have to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you sure did. That is, that's wonderful. And I love the way that you talk about, you know, it serves the story, not just this abstract, you know, to, to make something new just for news for the for the sake of, of something new that you really you know have that humility to say no you know it's we need the audience to to feel like this is for them and and to have a story to follow something that they can really connect with and i think that that is such an admirable quality of a composer especially today so thank you for um for articulating that and so talk to us about so we just heard a little bit of the way that you compose for orchestra for a, you know a group that does not deal with text in addition to the music um, but you are also a prolific song composer and i would love to know about the way Way that when you are writing a piece then that has the addition of the words, how does that affect your approach? Does that heighten that theatrical quality or talk to us a little bit about your process there? 
Well, there's a lot of extra gauges uh, when you're dealing with writing for voice and not just writing for voice, but for writing for a specific voice. Uh, the Fall of the Leaf, today's work, for example, uh, is written for your uh, instrument. So you're not just writing for uh, you know an objective uh, mezzo-soprano, you're writing for, for specifically your tessitura, your breaks, your sound. Um, that's one aspect of it. Um, choosing the text is kind of critical. Um, finding uh, <laughs> something that has enough words to, uh, to fill a song, um, although that can be very, very few words, uh, and not too many that, I, that, that it's within the context of this poem uh, that I selected. I only picked three double stanzas, six, six stanzas of the poem from selected throughout the poem because that was enough to say. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, in selecting a text, it has to sort of speak to me. Often when I'm reading poetry in books, as, as I did to find this particular poem, uh, I'm looking for something that starts the music going on in my head. I can hear how that's going to sound. I, I know what that is. Uh, and I'll often just you know make notes right in the margin immediately. Like I'm hearing this line with that phrase. And then there's sort of shaping the song as the whole. Now that we've got our six stanzas, there's a shape to the whole piece. Um, for me, it was this kind of gigantic ABA form where um, we're, we're starting with the, the tail end of fall and winter coming. And I wanted to have those images in there with a big middle section talking about this cricket and their story about how they're settling down for winter. Lastly, there are images in each section of the music that I want to set deliberately. And I mean as deliberately as a, a Mickey Mouse cartoon. Um, my comp teacher at uh, Worcester, Jack Gallagher, would talk about Mickey Mousing. Um, that passage from Mamal and the Night Visitors where he's running up to meet the, the visitors at the door and the, the little kind of climbing uh, oboe line, I believe it is, um, mm -hmm. mimicking the exact steps. That sort of detail, I'm not afraid to throw some of that in there. Um, there's a descending little tinkle of notes in the piano, uh, which for me is as deliberate a, a leaf fall as the uh, as Vince Guaraldi did with the falling leaves in the Charlie Brown Christmas special. There you the go. leaves fall off the, the, that sad sack tree, there's a little tinkle of piano. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily too specific because music has plenty of vagaries as it is. In the middle section of uh, the art song of, of Follow the Leaf, uh, we're talking about a cricket. So I've got little cricket chirps in the piano, these little clusters of notes that are pretty unabashedly the sound that I hear of a cricket making, creak, creak, uh, which slows down and quiets uh, with a slow rhythmic pattern towards the end. Um, and again, it's, it's a hook for the audience to, to get under the skin of that gorgeous uh, text that Thoreau wrote. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I love the way that you bring the audience in and that you're not, you know, that's not uh, above you or, or excuse me, that, 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 you know, you're not above those things um, because they are so incredibly crucial and the audience connection is what it's all about. And I love the way that you are so focused on that. And of course, you know, it's to your great benefit because the audiences absolutely love your music in whatever form that you compose. So it just is absolutely to your credit. And thank you so much for articulating those things to us. So Chris, with your extensive theater background that was so wonderfully able to be tied together with composition, thanks to the supportive faculty at the College of Worcester, um, it seems to me perfectly logical that, you know, theater and, um, and music, all of those kind of elements were always a part of your compositional process. Would you say that would be true? You'd think it would be. Uh, that's not really the case. There, there was a period there um, and it was, very much in grad school, uh, where I was moving further into music for the academy, music for other people who had studied music. And, and that makes sense uh, for a composer who's, I was working on my master's in composition at the Peabody Conservatory at that point. And of course, there's an impetus, you're, you're at the Peabody, you should write something that's important. Uh, and I was trying to push the sound um, into less tonal language, into a more complicated language, one that still made sense to me emotionally. Um, but I, it, it came to a head very specifically when I'd written a quintet for Woodwinds. Uh, that I was rather proud of. Uh, it was, again, loosely programmatic. This was kind of based on the Ebola outbreak. So as you can imagine, it was a little angsty. Uh -huh. um, but it was a little atonal as well, a little dissonant. Uh, and I had uh, a good audience at the premiere of that, and including uh, the woman I'm married to, who is not a composer, likes music, loves jazz, 
but it hasn't studied this stuff. And after uh, the premiere of that, she came up to me and said, I don't get this. I don't get this piece. And I thought somebody that knew me through and through, knew me that well, was not able to emotionally connect to the music. Then I thought that that was on me. I was missing something. And pretty much at that moment, I started writing music that I thought might have a language that could connect with an audience. Not pandering. It doesn't have to just be three chord folk music, which I love as well. Um, I want to push them a little bit and, and paint a, with more colors. But I want something that, that can be connected to viscerally, that, that can connect with somebody who doesn't have to have graduate work in music. Yes. Oh, I think that is absolutely, that accessibility could not be more crucial at this time. I truly, that making that connection and making people feel like music, especially American music is for them, I feel personally is just of absolute importance. And I'm so glad uh, to, to know you and to know that that is something that's that's been so important to you for such a long time. I really pride myself that I feel all of the composers that I have featured on this series have similar sentiments that their music reflects. And I'm really I'm just so proud of that. So thank you for sharing that story. And you know, kudos to your wife for <laughs> for having a way to guide you, you know, for the way that that she brought that up to you because she didn't say it was a bad piece of music. She just said that she didn't get it and it didn't connect with her. And that, that you know, that was enough to, to really, you know, click you into a, a different perspective, a different mode. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, honesty can honesty can hurt. I mean, I've played music for uh, for people I care about and, and they don't like every piece I've written. Um, but it, it just it just pushes you to to do what I guess Ian Forster uh, advised only connect. Yeah. Yes, well said. That's absolutely right. I love that. So before Chris and I share this beautiful composition that he has written, especially for me and for this series that I'm just so honored to share with you, uh, Chris, we would love it if you would read the text of the poem for us. Sure. Uh, this is the fall of the leaf excerpted from a poem by Henry David Thoreau, the great American naturalist. He wrote this right about 1841. The evening of the year draws on, the fields a later aspect where, since summer's garishness is gone, some grains of night tincture the noontide air. And as the year doth decline, the sun allows a scantier light. Behind each needle of the pine, there lurks a small auxiliar to the night. I hear the crickets slumbrous lay around me, beneath me, and on high. It rocks the night, it soothes the day, and everywhere is nature's lullaby. But most he chirps beneath the sod when he has made his winter bed, his creek grown fainter but more broad, a film of autumn o'er the summer spread. Far in the woods, these golden days, some leaf obeys its maker's call, and through their hollow aisles it plays with delicate touch the prelude of the fall. The threadbare trees, so poor and thin, they are no wealthier than I. But with as brave a core within, they rear their boughs to the October sky. Thank you. That was absolutely stunning. You are such a gifted orator. Of course, with a theatrical background, I would expect nothing less, but it's... nonetheless, that was very impressive. <laughs> I, I, I love Thoreau and it, it is, he's spoken to me. Uh, it, in fact, I came to this author because he was uh, sort of a tentpole of, of my family, um, a kind of a writing in uh, his novel Walden uh, early on, um, the uh, only that day dawns to which we are awake has kind of become a watchword of my life. And I certainly spent a lot of time in his woods uh, and spent summers up in the main woods underneath the uh, Spencer Mountains, where he once trod, once he explored. Um, so, of course, it was natural to, to uh, for that this poem and I to uh, to get together. Yes. Wow. Well, I'm so glad that you did. <laughs> and for those watching, I certainly hope that you enjoy this beautiful piece. Evening of my year draws on, 
Chris, thank you so much again for composing such a gorgeous piece of music for me. I am just so honored by that. Andre, that's lovely. Thank you for, for bringing your talents uh, and, and your, your time to this work. Remember, composers, we just put dots on paper. Uh, you know, the, the voice is half yours. And physically, it's all yours. <laughs> um, you know, we're just writing the language. It's it's the, the musician, the performer that has to make it their own and bring it to life. And thank you so much for doing that so beautifully. Oh, well, thank you. And truly the pleasure was mine. Thank you so much. 
Well, let's turn a little bit now. You know, we've talked about the the way that you you really compose with the with the audience in mind, and you know, without oversimplifying, you know, you you really love kind of those those core you know chord progressions and things like that. Um, talk to us about the story behind your collaboration with Uphill. And <laughs> you know, we're just we are just turning you know a sharp corner here. But I just think that it is so important to share that with uh, with our audience today because it's another really important facet of what you do and it just shows what a well-rounded person and musician you are so i just i feel we just have to dig in there a little bit well my students always tell me to keep it real you got you got to keep your feet on the ground um and i always know which ones are getting busy with research when they suddenly find that i'm performing in a blues brand and uh, i have a stage name and everything uh, i go by cat daddy when i'm performing uh, and it's it all started actually in my classroom with one of my students uh adam nixon who goes by deacon blues uh, a gifted blues guitarist had a trio and uh, so of course uh, i would when I could attend his performances, so supporting my student uh, and, and in a selfish way because he was a very, very good blues musician. I really liked the music. Uh, I had been kind of going out furtively with my keyboard and borrowing a school amplifier uh, and playing out in, in cafes and doing show tunes and maybe a few classic rock numbers. Sure. And then I got my own amplifier, I was getting a little more serious about it. And I got a call from Adam saying, now I see you're on the list you know, to come see my band play at this restaurant tomorrow night. And he said, you will, you will bring with you your shiny new amplifier and you will sit in with us. And, <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I thought I'd go in and maybe play a two or three songs with them and then go in and have dinner and watch the band. Um, and I just kind of kept going and I'd say, well, I'll sit down. And I said, no, 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 you have, you have a, a, an electric organ sound in there. Just play some organ pads with this next one. And it kind of wound up being the whole show. And a few days later, he kind of came and said, the band wants you to be a part of the band. Oh and gosh. so for the last, uh, well, more than a decade now, uh, I've been playing regularly with Uphill. We have a few albums out and we've even gotten some love on uh, local public radio stations. Um, one of which a fairly large radio station, WHRO, uh, their, um, their blues host and their new music host, Paul Chagru called us one of his favorite 10 best albums of the year uh, when we were released. So pretty cool. Yeah. I still go out every, uh, every week or three and, uh, and gig with the band and um, you know, and have a, it's a great time. It's, it's a, it's a way to, to be a musician and, and keep honest. And it's not the classical music I'm singing with the Virginia symphony. It's not the, some of the music that we're analyzing that are Bach chorales, but it's just as, uh, as, grounded in the same theory and i'll tell you one more since adam was one of my former theory students we have shortcuts in the band so the other two uh, members of the band the bass and, and player and the drummer don't have the theory but adam and i can say all right we're going to five of five now and we're going to do a four on the second measure and we know no matter what key we're in we know how to find each other musically really quickly wow oh well that's that is wonderful. Well, I, you know, for the wonderful oration that you gave of the the Thoreau poem, I feel like we really need to to bookend that to balance that with showing a little bit of you um, and your you know your funky moves there on the keys. So if it's okay with you, I'd love to to cut to just a short clip of of uphill. This was a uh, a TV feature, I believe. Um, yeah. and Okay. Yeah, Chesapeake had us uh, had us in um, uh, to uh, to play a couple of numbers for them on air, and uh, went so well they had us back. Um, so yeah, here's a, an, an excerpt from the TV program "Thinking Out Loud" with uh, with my band Uphill. <laughs> Well, Chris, 
I am so impressed. I mean, you are just a jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps me busy and some theater when nobody's looking. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. When you have the time. Wow. Well, I just, you know, it's, it's wonderful to, to see all of the, the different facets of your musicianship. And again, all at such a incredibly high caliber. Um, so we've talked about, you know, your classical composition, your, uh, your trajectory with that, with both the orchestral and the writing for the voice. We've now seen, you know, your um, your blues side. But let's talk a little bit more. You, you mentioned when we were talking about uphill um, that it started with this, you know, with the student of yours. Uh, talk to us a little bit more um, as we close, because I think it would be a wonderful way to to kind of send off with with a really wonderful, inspiring message as a teacher and especially as a teacher that had such wonderful supportive professors yourself when you were going through school talk to us a little bit about your your process and your approach um, during um, uh, sorry uh, okay let me just go back for a second um, talk to us a little bit about your your approach with pedagogy oh sure um, well the gig there is to find the avenue uh, where my students are. Everybody learns in their own way. Uh, some uh, learn by hearing. Uh, many learn, uh, as, as I do, uh, by seeing. They're visual learners. Some do learn kinetically. And so in the classroom, I try to bring all those elements together and find ways to present the material uh, that that will meet their learning style, um, and also, uh, and I, I talked earlier about keeping it real, keeping your your boots on the ground. I think that it's important to keep tied to the music that they're listening to on their own time, in their headphones as they're walking across campus, and and showing how it, it it's all kind of one art form, even though we have so many micro subgenres in there. Uh, and so uh, when we're introducing. Uh, a secondary dominant chord, I might start off with grabbing a hymn out of the, the Methodist hymnal, or uh, if I'm doing a borrowed chord, I might turn to a Beatles tune, as likely as I will turn to uh, a, a Puccini aria. Um, but, but all of these roads uh, are worth it. And most importantly, um, even though a lot of my students, most of my students are not going to be composers, and some may, may never write anything for public performance, uh, every semester, every semester, we use the new materials that we've been studying, usually the new harmony, and create a piece of music and present it to an audience, even if it's just our own class or my combined classes or a small recital when COVID allows us to do so. Um, we do that every term uh, because otherwise theory is just theoretical and it's got to remain first, foremost, and always a form of expression of human passion. Uh, it's an art as much as it is a science. And so I ask all my students to write original music and present it for better, for worse, um, to use those tools to say something about themselves. Wow. Those students could not be more fortunate to have you, Chris. That is such a, a beautiful combination of elements that you put together to empower and encourage your students. That's excellent. And goodness, I, you know, that's the kind of teacher I would wish for every student in every discipline. Um, so kudos to you for all of the wonderful work that you do. I'm sure your students just adore you. And as you say, you know, regardless of if they go on to pursue a degree in, in composition, to, to pursue a career in composition, or if they, you know, never have anything performed past your class, what they learn about music and the way that music is important to us as part of the human experience is something that they will carry with them and that will continue to inform them for the rest of their lives. So what you give to those students is profoundly important. That's wonderful. I, I hope so. And even if you're not going to be a musician, um, learning a little bit about what makes music tick can just make it more fun for you to listen to and make it a, an inherent part of your life. And if you're going to go off and be a, a doctor or a lawyer, maybe just pick up that clarinet or your guitar on the weekends even. Um, it's worth the doing and it's it's i think it's worth the investment we don't have any creative outlet as human beings um we're pretty badly stuck yeah yes well said and that is excellent advice for each and every one of us so 
Thank you. And what a wonderful high point to, to end this absolutely wonderful interview today. So Chris, I could not be more grateful for your time, your talents, sharing all of the wonderful stories of your life's journey and how you are continuing to shape the lives of your audiences and of your students. It is profoundly inspiring and I am just so proud to know you. So thank you so very much. Kudos to you. Thank you for your talent, for your instrument, and of course for raising the voice for uh, not dead and not uh, non-American uh, composers. There's a there's a there's a few of us here uh, right on our own shores um, that are, are expressing ourselves. And thank you for uh, for giving us a little bit of a, a megaphone. Um, I hope that uh, the folks that are watching this go out and listen to uh, American and international composers that are, are living and breathing and have stuff to say right here in the 21st century. Yes, well said, here, here. And you know, it is absolutely an honor for me to be an ambassador of this music and to feature and support you all as much as I possibly can. So thank you so much for allowing me to do that today. And for those of you watching, this has been the Living Legacy Series, and we hope you've enjoyed it.